get into uh, the Commodore business? Uh, when? What year was that? Well, the first one I got was a VIC-20, which would be about 1981 or 82. Were you, so you started in the VIC-20 era, you didn't start with Commodore Pets? No. Hmm, okay. No, I knew of them, but I wasn't that interested in them at, at that time. I looked at a radio shack that they sold uh -huh. about that time. I can't remember the numbers of a TRS something, of course. Yeah, TRS 80s. Before that, it was it was it looked like a modern a little tiny one, hmm. but this big. It didn't matter the keyboard. Okay. I, I think it had 4K maximum. Hmm. Okay. Maximum. Do you recall what that was? It was a radio shack. I only know that handheld. I guess you could call a it handheld. I don't know well, about those. Big. Pretty expensive, three or four hundred. But you started with the VIX. Yeah. Uh huh. And and you you your your dealership was where was it located here in? Right here. Right here in the house. Yeah. Right. Your your place of business business was the house. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I always thought you had a uh, an office someplace, and then and then we and then you moved everything to the house. No, never always, did. Always from the house. I actually started just with a few friends and then expanded, you see. Uh huh. And then went from there. Um, of course, I never told some of my suppliers I was doing business out of my house. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some of their wholesalers, like power, people who sold auxiliary power supplies and so forth and so on. With, were amazed at the volume I was doing out of my house. How much volume was that? Well, I did better than anybody in the state of Oregon and Washington on power supplies for about three months. Okay. I can remember the figures. Well, That's what some of the manufacturers told it, told me. It People had it in downtown stores. And that's power supplies? Just power just, supplies? Just power supplies. Wow. Well, Auxiliary ones. A lot of them were, a lot of the original ones were failing, huh? Well, I, most of them are still out there. I have all, there used to be about 500 Commodore power supplies aligning the edge of my lawn. <laughs> I took pictures of that. Lawn decorations. I took pictures of that and sent it to a Commodore rep one time. I said, the most practical use for your power supplies. I went to a Commodore show at one time where they were on the Coliseum and I appeared as an interested purchaser and they were just promoting the Commodore monitor and that was one of the best products they had. I, I, oh, I said, thank you. Why do you say that? I said, because you didn't make it to Hachi did. <laughs> I wasn't very complimentary. No, it wasn't. But I did tell them one time, and I still believe that. I said, if you paid any more than a nickel for your voltage regulators that you use in your standard Commodore 64 power supply, you're getting took. Huh. That's the cheapest. You couldn't make them any cheaper. And in my experience, people may not agree with me, the biggest single cause of catastrophic failure of a Commodore 64 is a power supply. Yes, that's true. I think so. Uh, well, nowadays, even even with uh, better power supplies, I mean, other things are failing on the Commodore or the Commodores now, you know, like the VIC chips and the SID chips are failing on the 64s and the 128s. Yeah, because, because those are the chips that run hot. Did you do a lot of replacement with chips also? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. I even get good. No, number one, number one replacement chip was a PLA. Okay. Programmable logic array. Uh huh. Next would be the sound chip, probably. Mm hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, uh, I, had a, I had a deal with a local, it, because we have Hewlett Packard, as you know. Hewlett Packard here and, in town. Yeah. Okay. And other electronic manufacturers, including Intel. Okay. So therefore, there are chip dealers, man, not manufacturers, but uh, big the big boys are some of them here, including Signetics, who makes PLAs, by the way, oh, for okay. Commodore and everybody else. I wasn't a Commodore chip, but made by Signetics. Okay. It says so right on a lot of them. And the PS, a PLS 100 is what it'll say on it. Well, I made a deal that I 
told us, I went down and saw him and brought one of the chips with me. I said, I don't have any idea what this chip is, but it does say PLS 100 on the back side. Can you duplicate this? Yes. Does it have any numbers on it? And I said, no. And he looked at me and he knew darn well they probably did an hour before, but the number 600 grade sandpaper took care of that. Because they wouldn't duplicate a chip that has a Commodore number on it, of course. <laughs> Okay. And I b probably bought as many as at least 500 okay. and sold them to Commodore dealers at a less price than Commodore could. Huh. <laughs> wow. And were. they are a better chip. Why I say that? Oh, okay. Now, your your dealership here, uh, your dealership, was it listed as an official Commodore dealership or no? No. no. W were there official Commodore dealerships here in Portland? Um. Yes and no. <laughs> Yes and no. Well, Montgomery Ward was official Commodore dealership. Okay. You want to call that? Well, uh, maybe I should say an official Commodore repair center. There you okay. Go. Yeah, there probably were. There were probably half a dozen in the Portland, oh, Vancouver area. Half a dozen. Yeah. But yours was not an official Commodore repair station? Or no, but it wasn't very long. I was doing more than any of the rest of them. Huh. Well, part of the reason, it might be of interest to you, Okay. that I got involved with, I've well, always been involved with electronics, I always liked it. From the, from the, I always say from the time I hooked the electric fence up to my mother's clothesline, okay. I used to like electronics. <laughs> okay. But the my main guy that did the repair work for Commodores, he was at very knowledgeable, and he had this stuff available from Commodore, you know, and the manuals. Which are get very hard to get to begin with because the only one that had any manuals was Commodore themselves. Okay. And uh, and also they would take about a hundred pages to write down on things you needed five pages of, as a lot of other equipment is done the same way. But I didn't like the way for some reason I didn't like the way I, he operated. He charged you fifty bucks. Okay. Flat rate, and he picked your Commodore. That included a broken five cent fuse or the entire board trashed. But he charged you 50 bucks. A flat rate? Flat rate. Okay. I decided that I don't think I'll do that. So I passed out, left at a radio shack store. Little deals I just made myself. On, uh, we charge for what we do, not what we think we need to do. Words to that effect. And of course he didn't like me very well after that. And I didn't care for him either. I don't think that's fair to charge 50 bucks for a fuse. And I repaired enough that all it needed was a fuse. Uh -huh. So I had, by then. Then it got to be, the word got around a little bit through some Radio Shack stores. Oh, you got one of them Commodore things instead of one of our TRS 80s? Yeah, well, there's a guy we know that can repair them. And my name got around that banner. And then I had more than I could do by far. And I just run into a fellow that was interested in computers, all the way from Timex to all the other little ones. They had the Coleco, you know. And he was also a TV, TV repair man. Yeah, I agree with And he uh, and I, he did the heavy duty repair. And of course, I learned from him. What was his name? Dave Kelmer. Okay. Is Dave Kilmer still around? Yes. He oh. works at uh, Clackamas Computers oh. here in town. In the PC world. Well, well, he left my or my business to go to work for them. So was he like a partner or a... a, a, a He's an employee. Oh, he was an employee of yours. Yeah, employee. Okay. Yeah. I paid him so much an hour. Uh -huh. And we got, we got busy. We did work for schools. Did a lot of the schools here in the Portland area have Commodores? Oh yes, they certainly did. David Douglas brought over, I think, was over 80 of them. 80? Computers. <laughs> I, mean, I had to home from work one day and they couldn't even get in the front room. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they, you know, various schools would bring them. And, and uh, generally in... Uh, and, um, These were VIC-20s or 64s? 64s. Just 64s, okay. 64s. Okay. Uh, and they bring in 1541 drives and 64s. Okay. And generally about the first part of uh, July. 
and we would have to have them all ready to go by the 1st of September. So we would have quite a bit of time to get them ready. You would receive them when? Oh, probably maybe middle of July. Middle of July, okay. On through August, mm -hmm. depending different schools. And we'd store them in my bedrooms and where else. Would these come from the elementary schools or from also like the high schools or Everything. junior school, middle, junior highs? Every, everybody. Depending on the school. Okay. What they use them for. Primarily, uh, oh, I don't know, you as a school teacher would put better words on this, but somebody in the eighth grade level and above, which were those computers would be used then. Hmm. that I bought in. And primarily, as we can all realize, primarily most of my work was disk drives. <laughs> Misaligned disk drives, or dirty disk drives. Mm -hmm. I just turned in a whole bunch of disk drives to Ray Carlson there in Washington State. Said, Ray, get these disk drives working again. Oh, really? Yeah, he's still into his repairs. What does he do to clean up a, a line one? What's uh, he charge, approximately? Clean and lube and line, maybe twenty dollars. Very reasonable, actually. Uh -huh. If it's uh, if it's something like a bad head, oh, he can, <laughs> he he'd have to scavenge for for a, a, a head from another yeah. machine then, because yeah. you can't find get those parts anymore. No, you can't. No, I I never I've talked to him uh, by email, but I've uh -huh. never talked to him. One on one, apparently he, I. I have his phone. He, I have his phone number. If you want his phone number. <laughs> uh, he already told me. Uh, he said he doesn't. He preferred not to con communicate on the phone. Oh, well, what's so up with that? Well, he, that's what he said. He, yeah. never, he never said anything like that to me. I don't know why, but he said, "What well, nasty!" He didn't mean it. Uh huh. It's derogatory, but he. He, he said he, he couldn't talk good on the phone. He said he couldn't. He apologized for himself of not being a very good spokesman. Well, I don't know about, I don't know about he, that. Every time I, I talk with him, he's fine. Yeah, how old a person is? Uh, Ray just retired from his job at the University of Washington in Seattle. So he's uh, 63? Oh, yeah. 60, yeah, 63, something like that, 64, something like that. He retired a little bit early. I guess he'd been doing it for a long time. Oh, yes. It's funny, I, I had never heard of him until recent years. I never heard of him during the time I was in business. Right now he's working on my, uh, he, he fixed up my drive, those drives really fast. Now he's working on the Educator 64 that I, I okay. gave him. You know, those Educator 64s, which was a Commodore yeah. keyboard. What is it, this huge pet case? Did you work on any of those? No. Here? No? Okay. Never worked on one of those. I knew what they were. Uh-huh. No, I never. I think, and we did very little in the way of monitor repair. Oh, there's a reason. Why is that? Unless you're licensed by the state of Oregon to work on that, you can be fine. The big fines. I did not know that. You oh, had to yes. be anybody working on a TV set. Uh huh. With a CRT in it. Uh huh. The state of Oregon has laws that Washington apparently don't. Oh, okay. I don't so know. So we stayed. A, we did a little of it. Well, Dave had had his license, but it but had he had his license because he Dave, he's the guy that worked with me. He, he worked for a TV repair shop. Okay, but he didn't like to work with it here because of his license was referred to the name of another shop, not this one. Yeah, and uh, so this address did not agree with the address he had. <laughs> yeah, so he was careful with it because I, he told me he knew of some people that had found out about that, so he didn't want to do it, and I couldn't, so I just didn't. Your your business was primarily hardware hardware sales and repair, or yes, did you also get into to start off with? Then it became everything. Software. Yes. Uh -huh. At the insistence of my customers. Oh, okay. The software side of it was can you get any software? Can you order this for me, or specifically, et cetera, et cetera. So it evolved, and of course, in, uh, the business became first thing I tried to arrange was was. Uh, a place to get decent power supplies at a decent price, so I could be competitive with my, you know, and I was able to arrange a, arrange a deal. And of course, I've been in the business world and purchasing, so I do know that if you, if you get a price for them, you get a price of them for five, they're not going to like it very well. 
So ask for a price for 25 right off the bat and get started. Or otherwise, otherwise you don't mean what you're talking about. <laughs> the first order of monitors I ordered from Magnavox. I ordered 50 monitors. Oh, wow. I'm in, I'm in business. I'm serious. Yes. Now I want a price. You want it by, you want it, want it by a certified check or what? I'm no, I used to be in purchasing and I've dealt with a lot of people that want a good deal for a hundred of an item. Then order five of them want the same price. I've seen the trick. So I never did that. So I was, so that's part of the reason I think I had a little edge on buying. Oh, well, business people think differently than, you know, than, than my way of thinking because I'm a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I think you know what I mean. People like to make deals. Yes. But, but there are two sides of that deal. Anybody that I don't know over Canberra's turn up wants to buy a hundred of an item. I'll believe, I'll believe about that much of what he's telling me. Hmm. They want, what they want is a hundred unit price and only buy two. <laughs> That's what they want. <laughs> of course. They, 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 I, they want I've been, to save I've been, money. I've been around that game. So made along uh, hard supplies became the the um, biggest hardware item to start selling, and uh, well, Fred Meyer started selling a good power supply too. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a solid, non-repairable one, but it's certainly better. You probably run into that brand, Recaton. Yes, Recaton. Yes, Pretty I know good, about Recaton. Not bad power supplies, considering they're not repairable, like just like Commodore. Mm. And then I got into refer, uh, wanted to find out if I could get monitors, possibly, because there wasn't that many being built by anybody. Commodore 1702 was close to three hundred dollars when yes. it first came out, uh -huh. right. if I remember right. Uh -huh. So I noticed a refurbished monitor at Costco. Okay. My Magnavox so I took all the numbers of it, did a little research. And called him and mentioned my minimum order to begin with would be a dozen. Can we work something out? Well, the only thing I had of what kind of trade references do I have? Well, I had the power supplies, you know, uh -huh. as a reference, plus a letter from the bank, or whatever what would you desire. I mean, I ordered as high as 20 monitors at one time from Mega Vault in South Carolina hmm. and could sell them and make some money on them and the same price that Costco sold. So I did okay. Oh, very good. Yeah, then. and then if you ordered so many, they would ship them free. Oh, wow, that's even better. Yeah, I think it had to be 20. Yeah, I think we ordered a lot of the last batch where we ordered some, uh, uh, what do you call it, Max, and we still got a couple of those up. Still got a couple of them made for the Macintosh. Yeah. Oh, huh. I they were refurbished. And it had to be sold as such, and they were stamped as such. But they sold for 20% or 25% less than the same monitor. So to get the whole the whole deal, we had to take some of those because they didn't have any more of the colors left. Hmm. We took all the You 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 got into you got in after the 64s. <coughs> you got into the plus fours and the C 128s also. Not. No, not as heavy unless I had to. I got into the 128, but I never had anywhere near the uh, volume of work with 128. Why? There isn't as many, there isn't as many of them. Oh, okay. And plus the fact they're better constructed. Ah, okay. With that metal that's over the top of the boards on all the 128s. Yes. That's a heat sink, as you know. Yes. And I think I'm quite sold on that idea to make those chips last a little longer. And the power supplies of the C one twenty eight were better, right? Oh, by far. Mm -hmm. There were there were a couple of different models. One was four and a half amps, and one was uh, two and a half amps. Uh huh. Something like that. Two and a half or three. Uh -huh. Something like that. The four and a half was better. I know you have some software in there for for Amiga computers. Did you get much into the Amiga computers for selling and fixing them? No, I no, I tried to. Uh, the only reason I had some Omega stuff in there is by request. And I most of my my customers that went into the Omega side of it, 
I give them some catalogs of here, pick out some that you think is good sellers. And then I had some enough customers I thought it was worth talking it. But I never got into the repairs of it. Oh, okay. I said, the only thing I got in the mega was this software side of it. And there would be something specific that a mega owner might want. And if there's some money in it for me, I may do a little research, see if I could find it and make a little money for myself. But other than that, I didn't know. What? Were there computer shows here in in uh, Portland uh, when you were in business? Did you go to the computer shows? Yeah, they had them at the Coliseum. Two or three at least. Commodore used to have a booth. Oh, wow! Manu Manu Community. Where? Manu Community. You and Bart went to that one. Oh yes. See, I made I made a chip. Huh? I gave you one, and I never heard back from it. <laughs> you you? The, the custom chip that you yes. yeah. Did you ever plug that in? No, I didn't. <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll plug it in one of these days. Anyhow, we uh, made those chips, you know, with a look more like a computer. Who ever heard of a computer with a blue screen? Uh-huh. Except Commodore. Right. So we made it kind of a standard. I don't remember. What was it? Dark gray? Oh, yeah. Or green? Oh, I don't remember anymore. Anyhow, we made chips. And for a while, we... Uh, we thought we had a contract with a fairly large school district. Which and school district is this? That'd be David Douglas, is who we were talking about. But okay. they never came through with it, and what they were inquiring about, and I was working with them, is all, they probably had three or four hundred at least, Commodore 64s. Okay. And they were disappearing. Disappearing? Well, the kids would go home in a minute, <laughs> put it that way. I'm being nice. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I was talking to them. Custodian, I guess you could call him, of this inventory of one of the teachers. And I said, well, you could sure fix that fairly easy if you wanted. Put a custom chip in there oh, with yes. your own, and put the property of David Douglas instead of Commodore 64, so many bites free. Program it that way. And But it was, they didn't want to go for the cost. So we never, it never came to pass. Oh, huh. well, it sounded like a good idea. It would have been. We did some. We did some for individual users, put their name in there. Uh -huh. But that's work, that's, and it's, it's, it's just as much work for every single one is work. You can't just mass produce them. People don't have mass produced names. <laughs> uh -huh. these, these, these computer shows in the 1980s, uh, like, were, were there thousands of people who came to these shows, or hundreds? or Hundreds. Hundreds. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and did you go there as a vendor, or did you just walk in as a regular person? I just walked walk in, in as a regular. Oh, okay. You didn't have a table or a booth no. or anything like that? Yeah, you did at my community. Well, I w one time did. Well, they had, we had what they call a local fair. Okay. A small. And they had a computer section along with other hands and crafts and so forth in, in Grisham. And, we, and I went to that show one time. And what did you have at your table? We had these custom chips. Okay. And uh, what else did we have, Tony? Oh, I mean, you showed them how to do banners and kind of showing how to use the computer was half most of it. And I had my business cards out there for sale. Yeah. And that's when Bart. Was yeah. Doing. Who but, is who is Bart? Oh, Bart was a good friend of mine, and uh, he knew how to run the Jason and Ronheim heat ah. pump burner, and ah. he knew how to do it. Jason Ronheim. And he made these chips. He made these chips. You Jason know, Ronheim was a manufacturer of an EEPROM burner. You know, you can you can buy a, a replicas of those EEPROM burners now from Australia. There's an individual in Australia who's taken the Jason Ronheim design, and and he's improved on it a little bit by putting in a pass-through port on it, I think, on it or something like that. And he sells it from Australia for about a hundred five dollars. That's reasonable. That is reasonable. Where are you going to get foam from? You're going to pay two or three times that for anything anywhere. Anything in the burner. Oh. From any manufacturer. Pay 200 or more. Today's world, you bet. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, he, 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 he makes them. He, uh, uh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe it's not from Australia. I'm, I'm maybe confusing with another person. Maybe a person here in the United States who does it for hundred five dollars. Uh, okay, my my memory is going there. Uh, it, it, 
the information's on the Commodore 128 forum. Uh, oh. And, uh, and uh, there's a person who does it. So. And, uh, it's a well-known person. You, you uh, know it's it. not well known. I know one of our club members. He bought one of those boards, and he he brought it to one of our club meetings. And he said, "Here, look. This is the way you burn chips with a Commodore." And he showed it to us right there in the meeting. It was very interesting. Yeah. I know what little I knew about it. It wasn't that simple at all to uh, take Commodore's ROM and adapt it to your name or whatever. Uh -huh. It wasn't, it wasn't a plug-and-go type of operation. You fear one byte all on the end or the beginning, oh, yes. uh -huh. and you got to program it. it about, you get with your burner. You got to program it so that it recognizes by the device it's going to be plugged into. Otherwise, what good is it? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have a, uh, if you're going to modify something, he was showing me. You can't just put this in here. You got to use it. Because there's only eight characters that right. we replaced it with, and 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 there was and there was uh, uh, ten characters from the original. You got to put it in spaces. Uh, yes. Everything's got to be just right. Yes, it has to be just right. I remember that we had at our uh, at the last Commodore Vegas Expo last year, last summer, we had a person come in with a burner. He says, "I can yes. do a custom chips. You want one, Robert?" And he, I said, "Okay." And sure. he said, I think he charged like twenty dollars or something like that. And he he took a chip and then he you know he had to put in the little spaces and the letters yeah. and the characters. And he if he did it wrong, it would cut. He you know waste the chip. He said, Oh, I did it wrong. I'll have to burn another one. You know, and do it correctly. Yeah, but yeah, he probably had a uh, probably had a deal where he could erase it. Uh, he wasn't done with the Commodore. I know that. <laughs> he was doing it with something else. Oh. oh. But, but he could erase the chip then. Uh, that he did burn mistakenly, couldn't he? Uh, I don't think so. It was like burn once, that, oh, that was oh, it. Oh, really? Yes. If he made a mistake, he oh, wasted the chip. No. Right, right once, <laughs> that's it. That was too expensive. In my day, but I remember. <laughs> Boy, you, you could erase yours, couldn't you? Yeah, heck yes. I built my own eraser. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember using you. Using the that. same type of. Uh, Tubing that they use in clothes dryers. Uh, By the way, it's an ultraviolet light. Okay, ultraviolet light. I know about that. So I put that in a, in a little dust lamp that you use above your bed. Okay, put yes. Put two of them in there, and makes a beautiful eraser for heat problems. <laughs> okay. And those, those heat problems, you have that heat problem of what we burned. You know, what is custom wrong. You have one yet? Do you still have it? <laughs> yes, it's probably sitting in the kitchen of my place. <laughs> yeah. Kitchen? Why is it in the kitchen? It in sometimes. It's a, be, it's a direct replacement for the Colonel Rom. Okay. By the way, that chip in blank form is no longer available. Oh, speaking either. Speaking it's of made e by Motorola. Speaking of EEPROMs, uh, Ray Carlson and Francois Levelier of Canada, they now do PLAs, which are basically EEPROMs. So if your if your PLA burns out in your in your Commodore now, they just replace it with a more modern EEPROM, and it runs cooler and it doesn't burn out. And they charge like eight dollars, <coughs> seven, eight dollars. I tried to run that down because, in my knowledge and books I've got, and I've got a few, there's no relationship between a PLA configuration patented by Signetics and and an EEPROM. No relationship. Hmm. I got a buff of nothing but EEPROMs. The, the input voltage is even in a different place. So I've heard that story before, what you just told me. And I, if it hadn't been Mary Carlton, I would have said, yeah, fine. <laughs> well, no, I have one of them in my, in my, in one of my yeah, SX-64s. I just don't quite understand. Because I had a burned out uh, PLA in my SX-64, and he replaced it with the, you know, one, the, the newer style. I said, hey, it works fine. I'm strange. Uh, okay, email email Ray about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Get the specifics. You technicians, you talk your te technical language with each other. <laughs> I know, but I think you know where I'm coming from. Uh-huh. To me, it's a much different between a, a Signetics PLA and an EEPROM as there is between a RAM chip and a ROM chip. Hmm. There's no relationship. I mean, I'm talking about the schematics. I got schematics full of probably fifty different 
knee problems. Huh. And they don't appear, none of them are even close to the PLA as designed and patented by Signetics. Mm. Who owned that? Well, maybe I'm using the maybe, so I'm, I don't using, get it. maybe I'm using the wrong term. Maybe it wasn't an EEPROM he's using. Maybe it's some other. I don't know what it could be. Chip, but it is a new design. I mean, it's That's easily I easily found nowadays. I know. It plugs, you know, it's. I've, I've heard it, this. It before. plugs into the PLA, you know, pin for pin configuration, yeah. all that. That's great. I sure can't find it. I mean, I'm the type of guy that like to find what kind of a chip. I, I, I could send you. I could send you. My, I think I still have the emails about it. Uh, I could forward you the emails, and I'll tell the specification of the chip that Ray sent me to. Uh, and I forget what your email. I'd like to see it. I forget what your. I don't e want to argue with. I, I forget what your email address is. Is is Jim? Uh, is it Commodore Man or something like that? What's your What's your email address? Com Jim. Com Jim. That's it. C O M M hyphen J I M. Uh, okay. At AOL dot com. No, I am. Comcast. Oh, Comcast. Okay, got it. Com Jim. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not. I don't mean to be arguing about it. I just don't can't understand. <laughs> There's several factors that number one, Signetics wouldn't have their name on it unless they owned it. Who can buy and sell Commodore ever? Mm. The Signetics chip manufacturing company. Um, you were. You said all of these school districts gave you. Uh, I mean, had. You did the repair business for all these school districts. Not all, when, of course. Or a lot of these school districts. When did you see it start fading away? I mean, uh, you know, the school districts stop, you know, slow down on the business. Uh, oh, they would get a grant for Macintosh. Oh. And then, zip, that'd be the end of the Commodore. Oh. Just, it wasn't that little by little that piece. One. Because I bought stuff from schools about that time, uh -huh. and I buy every Commodore they had. So and that's the way they wanted to sell it. So, so when the Max started, I guess taking over in the late nineteen eighties, would it be the late nineteen eighties, or would you say early nineteen nineties? I would say so. Late nineteen early nineties. I would say. Early nineties. No, 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 no. Late eighties. Eighties. That's right your close. Okay. Well, we did. Commodore work on schools up until it was the end. In yeah, we did. Yeah, well, you know, it's the schools are smaller. Yeah. They 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 stopped manufacturing the the Commodore sixty four in nineteen ninety two. Yeah. So we did we did some repairs. It's about the time the I 90s. went out of business. But this was in Vancouver. When Toys R Us started selling them brand new with uh -huh, a right. guarantee for ninety nine ninety five. Right, I remember. Is what that. I put the handwriting on the wall to me. <laughs> I can't. I mean, it got too big a squeeze. Anybody, desirably, wants an estimate of the repair. My labor, my time, to remove an 80 pin chip and put it back in is 160 dollars to it. Period. In other words, a, yeah, in other words, you replace the 6526 CIA. It's an eight, It's a 40 pin chip. That's 80 dollars to it. Uh huh. So what the? So that makes uh, to make a difference. You got a couple of RAM out and one of those. You can't afford to repair it. You know, at the very end, uh, I, I heard or I read that Commodore only had like less than five five dollars worth of parts in the in the C sixty four. They were so they they were was less than five dollars worth of parts, but they were selling it for ninety nine ninety five. You know, at Toys R Us or whatever. I find that hard to believe. Yeah, uh, well, that's what they said. Not five dollars worth of parts. Because I saw statements of what they had to pay Signetics, <laughs> which owns that too. And the the C sixty four DTV, you know, the little joystick thing that 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 has thirty games, thirty yeah. games in one, yeah. and uh, has a really a, it's a Commodore sixty four built into a little itsy bitsy chip like that. So so that little joystick thing there, that's like eight dollars worth of parts, something like that. I don't know. Some of these things I've heard throughout the years. Or did I get a lot of it from customers? What, be, what do you mean? A lot of, oh, did you know that they got a new disc now that's four times the speed? Uh, they worked on the 1541. Uh, do they mean like a fast load? But they tell me. You were speaking about... Uh, 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 Some of the exaggerations. The exaggerations, that's it. The exaggerations. 
And people would come out that here. That people would tell you about or ask you about. Well, I, I'm just about done with it. I've got a hard drive just about all ready to go. I'll bring it out to you next week. Hard drive? Yeah. <laughs> a CMD hard drive? For a, what? For a I don't know. Okay. I never saw one in five years. There's a lot of what I used to call them self-appointed experts. Okay. A lot of men. I used to spread someone around myself because I got, I thought it was funny. They come in here with a little notch here and notch here. Yes. I just doubled the size of my disc. I said, really? No, I can record. I said, can you be recording both sides? Yeah, and I said, by turning it over, oh no. Well, my, my disc drive is special. It's got a head on both sides. They never made such a thing. Yeah, did we both know. Well, in the 1571s, yeah, they had the 1571 was a dream. People would come in with that kind of information to me. And I used to say, well, I'll tell you what, I got a patent that I'm working on. I would say this too. I notch it here, I notch it here, I notch it here, I notch it here, and I got a, I got a quad drive. And that got around back to me even. <laughs> In all my life, I've never heard so much BS about a product <laughs> than I did the 64 World. Well, I'll just answer. I mean, you know, the different drives they made, and how many different people that I knew that had some kind of reputation that had just about got their hard drive built. For years ahead of before we ever sold one. <laughs> Everybody was building a hard drive. Well, but and nothing came along. So, 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 when you were in business, you know, no one ever brought you a CMD hard drive or a no, lieutenant. No, they never made such a thing. Lieutenant Colonel hard drive or anything like lieutenant that. Lieutenant Colonel was barely in. They started up toward the end of them when I was at because uh, because I have a Lieutenant Colonel hard drive. Right, one of the first ones. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Successful one. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right, Lieutenant Colonel came out about uh, eighty-five. I can't remember the year. Yeah, I'd say 85. Right, and that's normal. Right? Uh -huh. And all the BS I was hearing would be from my 83 to 85, that era. Okay. And I mean, how many people that worked for Intel and, you know, or have a card from Intel, so I made them an expert. Or they worked for Hewlett Packard. I've just about got my hard drive all ready to go for the Commodore 64. I bet there's 50 people. I never saw one. <laughs> I never... I never, well, they, I never all those was. inventions must have been just one-offs. <laughs> I never heard. I mean, you know, I've been in the business world one way or another for a lot of years. And I could... I used to kid Dave when he came in. I said, what are we going to hear today that somebody invented? And the other thing that people seem to that they, they probably knew what a go-to was, and that was the extent of their programming, maybe. But... They had just about had a BBS program. And instead of a 110 baud, we'd go, we'd go somewhere like 2400. Mm -hmm. And getting 2400 baud out of a 300 baud modem was a common thing. Oh, boy, talk about BS. <laughs> I mean, I've heard it. Kind of impossible. <laughs> what I used to do, though, sometimes that wasn't real nice. They talk about baud this and baud that. I said, wait, what is baud? I know what it is. What the word "bod" is and yes. where it came from. It's a derivative of the word "bodo," which is a French word. But I got it involved by some French one that developed the number of speed, the speed of a transmission of that type. But that's the way I can say it. Okay. But these people will talk about "bod" and don't even know what the word means. I sometimes have a question mark in the back of my mind. <laughs> I guess I'm that type. But you, I don't know whether you noticed that so much as I did. The number of people that I would have as customers that would explain to me all this about Commodore three fourths of which was not true. <laughs> did you did you deal with other businesses in in the area or in Washington State, uh, like oh, I don't know, Software Support International up in in uh, in the Seattle area or? Software Support International was in Vancouver. Oh, I'm sorry, Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. Because all the software you saw out there, I bought from them. Oh, okay. Just before. Yeah, okay. So, wait a minute. You, you bought out, or they, they, they sold you, or somehow they gave you 
There was software supported industrial. Who else did you get software from? Or? Oh, the manufacturers all the way through. Well, I mean, the other businesses that were closing out of their 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 Commodore stuff. Well, there was a company that I never bought it. They already closed their software out, but I bought all their repair parts from a company downtown. What is the name of them, darling? Huh. Including pet chips. Pet, pet chips. Wow. See, uh, Ray Carlson, he says he'll never work on pets again because he can't find the chips anymore. I got a few. Oh, see. It's on my list that I send in. <laughs> I'd like to know what he... I asked him a couple of times on an email, never got a reply. I wonder what... I want to know, maybe you can help me We could call him up right now. <laughs> Well, maybe you could help me out a little. Okay. I can understand why he doesn't really want to talk about it, neither would I in similar circumstances. I'd like to know whether my chips that I'm selling are priced properly. And I asked Ray what he would, what, uh, what he got for a PLA or something like that. And, and he, I, the answer was something like about it depends. Well, that's, well, not, no, an, his, that's not an his, answer. His replacement PLAs are 7 or $8. That's what he charges for a replacement PLA. That's the kind that you're talking about. He uh -huh. makes out of a EPROM, which is just amazing. Because when I heard it has that... To be, it has to be at a certain speed. If it's, if it's too fast, like 45 nanoseconds, it would, it's, it's too fast. And if it's too slow, that's no good. It has to be a certain, you know, area there. I forget. I think the original PLAs were something like 120 nanoseconds, and uh, and uh, at, at first he was trying 45 nanoseconds. It was just just too fast for the Commodore, so he had to slow it down to something I don't know. Use use a replacement at 60 nanoseconds or 70 or 80 nanoseconds, something like because that. Because uh, most of what I've heard about this. It's been from you. Uh huh. Right now about this. You have pet chips because I get, I have, I have people on on the C128 forum. They're constantly asking like, where do I get this chip? Where do I get this pet chip? Where do I get this pet chip? Because no one has a source for pet chips anymore. I thought I was fairly well known, but I guess they don't know where. <laughs> Maybe I should advertise you more. There you go. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't had to. By the way, the last year, I haven't had very, very much business at all. Very little. Except tire kickers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't know Commodores had tires. <laughs> yeah, I got, got a guy recently. He wanted a real good price of me. He was going to work toward buying everything. A I price? Had. Oh, you mean for your, your entire business okay, yeah. here? I wanted to buy Wait a minute. He wanted to buy your buy the them. software and the hardware no, on the repair software. side? Just the software. Oh, just the software, okay. Because a lot of the hardware, is not unless you have some knowledge behind you, it's not going to be any value right. to you. Right, Any. Uh-huh. Unless you have some knowledge. Uh-huh. Lots of people that would be involved with hardware at all be, would be people like Ray Carlson. <laughs> Could, could fix it and make it work. But any event, I, I'm just an example of one guy. So I worked out a price for him. He'd take all the disc base, take all the cartridge base, take all this, and here's the discounts. Oh, I... I had those kind of people. Uh-huh. Which is normal. I, I don't remember. I used to be in purchasing for probably about millions of dollars worth in my, in my own work prior to this. And as usual, they buy a couple hundred dollars worth, and I say, "Last you hear them." <laughs> I, I I think I know why. Hackers. I think I know why about the prices of parts, because when I met him on Monday, on the way, well, I went from Astoria to Ray's place to drop off, you know, stuff to repair, and then I came back to Portland. I talked to Ray, and Ray told me directly. He says, "I'm a repair business. I don't sell parts. I sell repairs." Yeah. So, but doesn't I'm, he split if, up the if, cost of the part in the repair? Yeah, he does, but he just doesn't sell the part by itself. That's fine, I mean, that's common. But that doesn't mean he can't quote the price for the part for the hardware in him. I don't know. He certainly can. I mean, I think he, a little bit like Sal, but you think you kind of told me he's, just a, he's a pretty quiet type of person. Yeah. So on, maybe he's just a little bit. What shall we say, withdrawn, so to speak? No, maybe? well, with me, he's not withdrawn. Huh? When, 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 
when uh, when when he he met me, he was not withdrawn. Well, I don't know. Okay, so you had so so you got all of Software Support International. You got. I, did, I, I was allowed to pick and choose it. Well, pick and choose. And I did. And and wasn't there another company from back east that you got stuff from? Was it uh, oh, I got was it out of Michigan? Um, recently, I mean, within recently the, within the last year, I bought all the inventory and it was all Omega stuff. Recently, from yeah, Omega but, stuff. But, wow, there you go. They were they that's, were a wholesaler that's, that's back new, in my time, and they still had some me. stuff left, and they heard of me. Wow. I didn't know Can't that. Can't think of the name. Don't even remember. Oh, there wasn't that much. Maybe there was about a hundred. Okay. Pieces. Well, that's still good enough. I bought a bridge. Uh huh. But, Soft, uh, it was software, right? Yeah. Okay. It was a mega. I'll have to take a look at it. <laughs> it's, it's added to the list now, though. Oh, okay. Before. I I still have your old list from like two years ago. That's pretty still pretty close. It's really slowed down. Uh huh. Really, the business really slowed down. And I got a lot of stuff in there. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. It's just not moving. It's printers and monitors. Ah, uh, printers don't move at all. Monitors are hard to transport. Ship. <laughs> yeah, they're hard to ship. <laughs> That's true. Huh? People give me their collections. Okay. Oh no, not more monitors and printers. <laughs> oh, really? That's yeah. what I say. I go. Oh no. <laughs> what? What's your opinion? Uh, of the best reasonable price that is. There was a couple that were made that were very rare. The monitor made for the uh, 128 and uh, 64 monitor. Do you mean like a, a 1084 monitor? Yeah, that type. Oh, well. Well, I'm not a businessman, Jim. I'm, yeah, I don't I'm, mean, I'm just, that I just have a, a user group. I mean, we have this stuff, we have this stuff in storage. Okay. Uh, take away that 1084 monitor for twenty dollars. We'll just get yeah. it out of, get it out of our storage, or you know, take that 80 column monitor for twenty dollars. I don't know, yeah. so something like What's that. It but well, of course, I go a little further into it because I happen to know that a 1084 SD is a piece of junk. Oh, it is. To the compared to the SP. Oh, I think I have an SD someplace. Why, why is that? Why? Why do you say one is junk and the other is not? You can junk? never. From the day the SD was in. Introduced by Commodore, which is manufactured by Dai Wu. Okay. There was never, never available any parts, ever. Oh, no? None. Wow, from the beginning. So if you had anything even like a flyback transformer, something uh -huh. relatively simple. Uh huh. I bought it. Well, the P, by the way, I'm sure you realize it was manufactured by Phillips. The SP. S stood for stereo. Uh huh, right. And, uh, but the best one, uh, the best monitor of the bunch, if you ever run into one, it's, very, it's almost identical to the SP, except it's a little bit built. Better because it's built by Magnavox. The others are built by Magnavox to Commodore specifications. Wait a minute, I'm confused. Which, which is the, the very best one that you're talking about? The 1CM135, one one made by Magnavox. It's identical almost to the 1084. It's, it's only a mo it's a mo it's not a stereo. It's just monitor. Yes, it is. It's it monitor. Is? Just it's an almost identical to the 1084. Huh. I don't know if I have any if that if I have that one in, in storage. Well, it's a 1084 <laughs> SP by the way. It's Phillips. Okay. Made made under contract between Phillips and Commodore. Uh huh. That's what that monitor is. Where the other one is made by Phillips to look just like it, but it has Magnavox's nomenclature is a much better monitor because it's got twice twice the uh, shall we say capacity of the flyback transformer oh things like interesting. that interesting I did not so know that's that. why I say they what they one say I'm one thirty five I, I know that there were, there were certain Commodore monitors that we users feel like are junk <laughs> we're going to, well, that's, this 1802 was which was supposed to be the replacement for the 1702. Yeah. Okay. This 1802 is not very good at all. It's I terrible. Know, I, don't, I never did think that. I agree with you on it. It never was quite as good as the 1702. <laughs> uh -huh. But part of the reason is that the 1702 was made by Hitachi. The 1802, I can't remember who made it. Okay. 
right now, but it was not made by the same manufacturer. And who knows what kind of dealings Commodore had between the Hitachi, if you put this right, on. Right, right. You can take a 1084 and, a, and a, the other one I just mentioned, 135. Uh -huh. They're both made by bag box. The case looks the same, yes. everything looks the same. Yes. But open up the back and look at the difference. Oh. You can visibly see it. So you were going to say something about... I'm going to say sometimes, because of the number of customers I had, I feel I had probably about 3,000 customers. 3,000 customers yes. all had. Yes. I was in business for over over 10 years. Just, just schools and... I just threw away a lot of the old deals. I could just tell you mean, by... You mean old... The old tickets, the invoices. Oh, okay, okay. I just threw them away. And you could tell, count the number of invoices uh -huh. and say that everybody was here twice. You can pretty well determine another number of customers. You know. 3,000, that's oh, yeah. quite a did, did you Did you go to like, I don't know, uh, since I'm not from the Portland area, did you go to like to user group meetings here yes, in Portland? Yes, yes. Was I, there a... I, I a gave talks. Oh, talks. you gave talks. Yeah, as a guest speaker. Uh -huh. <laughs> and wh uh, like what were you, what were some of the subjects you talked about to these user groups? So, oh, it was at the beginning of the 64 war. I would take in a, a junk. Uh, five pin because they didn't make the eight pin yet. Eight pin video output. Okay. Yes. You know, I would take a junk five pin, which are pretty rare, and I would just start it myself, and I would take the three screws out of the bottom, which most of the people at the user group, so we say there are twenty-five to forty people there, uh -huh. had never seen the inside of a sixty-four. Okay. And I can't blame them. Not when they sold for three hundred dollars, they didn't take them <laughs> apart. <laughs> but in any event, I would have one apart and pass it around to the group, explain to me what those little black things in there were, what they kind of did in easy language, and they got a kick out of that. I'll also mention some little tidbits that I could pass on, you know, to make their little last a little longer. One of the things, one of the things I never failed to mention any time I did that, <coughs> would be on the older, earlier ones, they would use a piece of, of uh, tin foil covered cardboard yes, over the front for an RF shield. Right. They would cover the lower right hand corner, which is about an inch and a half square, right over the top of a heat producing uh. heat sink, <laughs> which traps the heat underneath the cardboard, which certainly doesn't do the components any good. So I used to tell everybody, take a pair of scissors and cut that piece of cardboard out so that <laughs> when the heat sink comes out. A lot of people just tell me, throw away the cardboard. Well, <laughs> it does, it does nothing. if it's there, leave it. Hmm. If it's there, I'd say to leave it. You say leave Somebody it, asked me. It was there for a reason. Hmm. I don't think it did near as much good as it could have. It's supposed to stop RF emissions. Yes. Uh, yes. You know, uh, it was supposed to be keep Commodore within the FCC guidelines. Or yes, whatever. yes. You can take a short wave receiver. In fact, I did that. <coughs> and take a short wave receiver and plug a 64 and go like that in front of me. Go, oh, ow, ow. Uh huh. It showed it was emitting some, some type of RF. Well, was there was there just one user group here in the Portland area, oh, or were no, there different? Were probably a dozen. A dozen. Oh yeah. Oh heck. There were a dozen. Gresham had one through the Mount Hood College. Uh huh. <coughs> one in Oregon City. Fire station group, I don't know where they came from, but that was a deal you know, about 20 blocks in there. Yeah, there, there, well, there was easily six ones that had probably 25 to 30 members each, at uh -huh. least. <coughs> Those of ones, maybe they, some of them came and go, they were groups of friends, that all they did is get together and copy each other's program. <laughs> and that was the user group. Okay. <laughs> Copying parties, there you go. Yeah. But, uh, I used to go and explain, explain them what, a little bit about what the inside of it was, and my little side point I think was interesting. And they were so, some are brand new, you know, the '64. Right. And uh, so, well, we we understand we can, you can copy some of these programs. Wasn't well, that illegal? Well, yes, it is illegal. Same as copying a book that you get from the library. Mm -hmm. You can read it, but you're not supposed to copy it. And so copying these programs is illegal. 
So who makes these cops programs? How long how are they allowed to do that? I said, I and of course it depended on the group and the circumstances. I would sometimes, not always, answer, who makes those copy programs? Well, I'm giving you a trite answer, but there may be an element of truth to it. I wouldn't be surprised if Commodore doesn't sell to make it because they certainly sell a lot of computers because of them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, by the way. I know of dozens of people that bought their 64 because of the availability of programs. Dozens in my time. They bought a 64 because they could get programs from nothing, from their friends. Oh, okay. That's a fact. So there was a lot of computers actually sold. Because of because of copied programs. Because they could get free programs for the cost of the disc. <laughs> oh. That's true. I'm sure I'm sure the, the, the manufacturer I mean the, the producers of these programs are probably wondering where's our money? <laughs> right, Compute Gazette. Okay. Or was there a magazine? Which yes. I, got. I think I've got almost every issue. I might be missing two of Compute Gazette, by the way. For about four years out there. Uh-huh. Compute Gazette had uh, had an ad on about page three. But uh, if I remember right, the name of the company was Electronic Arts. Okay, yes. Which are still in business. Yes, they are. And they produced a Field of Dreams or some similar title, whatever it was. They produced a program, and they outlined in that ad. I wish I still had it. In that ad, that they they would just hit the mark. And so many words they put down that it just hit the market two weeks ago. Already they have received broken copies <laughs> back at the home. Reason, italic letters us. We have produced our last program for the Commodore. Oh. So Broderbund, by the way, was really strong about that. If you copy print shop and they found out about it, they'd go after you. Oh, they did. I, did, they did. I didn't know that. Oh, yes, they, they were one. Wow. There were others that didn't care that much. Uh-huh. I wrote a bun right up to the end. Hey. Yeah, isn't Broder Bun still around? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah they, they, they still are. They, yeah, because they well, made print shop. I know there's print shop for the PC. Or I think it's still Broder Bun. I'm not sure. Huh, okay. But Broder Bun, I had, I talked to them personally a couple of times, because print shop was a pretty good seller up to a point. Uh, Pieces of software. Uh huh. Were you were you on good terms with the the big the big software companies? Well, I was with Broderbund Electronic Arts. Uh huh. I bought an I could see the handwriting on the wall, so I thought maybe at least my name wouldn't hurt <laughs> if I could say even if it was a little BS to it. In the put my name in their pipeline as a, as a commodore dealer that is going to be selling some software in addition to what I'm already selling. Well, they were I knew already they were, it's going to be going out. So when somebody would come along like me that say they're innocent buying software, I think that they went above board a little bit to say, who are you? Uh -huh. So I just had an idea. So I bought software directly from SSI. I made all the Dungeons and Dragons series. Oh, okay. And uh, from Electronic Arts, Epics, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen different companies toward the end there. Some I got burnt on too. I paid more money for them than I could bought it Wait six, six months later than I had from Software Support International. You got burned on? I don't understand. Wait a minute. I you, paid too much money for you it. You paid too much money and you couldn't sell them? No, not, not what Software Support International oh. sold them by the hundreds. Oh, I see. <laughs> to people besides me. I bought some of that stuff I got out there because it's very decent stuff. I mean, I bought some of so somebody else didn't buy it, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> Man, now some of the stuff I got the, from software support. Yes. Uh, like I said, I bought it so somebody else didn't buy it. I mean, you didn't get a, Oh, that's it. Now I remember the other name of the company down in the Michigan area was Sensible Software or something like that. Yeah, they're the uh, they're the ones that uh, came in after me and bought all the rest of it. Oh, so and, and I sold him a bunch of stuff too. Wait a minute, you sold Sensible Software some stuff? Or? Yes. Oh, that I had already bought from Software Support International. Oh, and he knew of me right away because they told him that they had already sold quite a bit of inventory uh -huh. to me. 
We took all the good stuff. We took, we took most of the good stuff. I just couldn't take all of it because they had 50 copies of print shop now. I don't. I'm not sure what sensible software is doing these days. No, nothing that I have, know of. Haven't heard from them in either. a long time. I haven't either. I occasionally did some repair of 128 and 64 for them uh -huh. that they took in from some of their better customers. Wait, you 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 repaired for 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 whom for sensible for software support international or for yes. sensible soft, software uh, so, uh, software software support international. Oh, okay. I can't think of his name. It's in there, Donnie. And the guy that owned Sensible Software for years. They're out of business now, I think. Uh, I know Sensible Software was uh, owned by one guy, one guy, and then he he sold it off to another guy. <laughs> exactly. The first guy, I'm, by I'm the forgetting way. Forgetting names. I'm sorry. The first guy, by the way, is there somewhere. Uh, I only I only talked to the first owner once. He talked to me a dozen times because he oh. bought he bought things like. Uh, uh, 1541 drive covers and 64 covers made uh -huh, out of uh -huh. brown. Yes. Well, I think he bought quite a bit of that. Mm -hmm. so, from me. Stephen Jones? No, no. S Stephen Jones is a is, is a, a user, uh, one of our, our members who lives up in Seattle, Washington. He's a young guy. And he's, who, he's, who, who's he? I don't know who he is. Don't Scott I? Parker? Scott, no. Sc Scott Parker, that's it. Scott Parker of, of, of Sensible Software. Yeah. That's the thing. He didn't like. He didn't. He didn't like me very well. Oh, he did. <laughs> well, he he would offer me something. He wanted to buy my my remaining software. Okay. Yes. About two years ago, and uh, I sent him a list and told him make me an offer. And of course, I said, "Well, that's just for the Omega only, isn't it?" <laughs> no, it's for all of it. I said, "Oh, thank you. Don't bother me." It was mm. $600.